Threadripper is upon us. And the question you may be asking yourself is, what motherboard should I buy? Well, I will never answer that question for you. I'm just gonna show you the features of the various motherboards that are available at the time of this video. First up, it's the Asus ROG Zenith 2 Extreme. Now, AMD actually sent me this as part of the press kit. So, just FYI, this is what I used. This is one of two boards that I used for all my initial testing, but don't worry. I've got boards from everywhere coming. This is the ROG Zenith 2 Extreme. This is the motherboard at the top of the stack, at least from the initial release from Asus. This is a TRX 40 motherboard. That's not gonna work with your first or second gen Threadripper CPUs. It is gonna work with the new 24 and 32 core Threadrippers. This thing is a monster. First up, let's take a look at the physical layout of the board. This board is a monster board. This motherboard has a built-in 1.7 inch OLED display, which is what your postcodes come up on, which is pretty neat. That's uh, similar to what I saw on the Socket 3647 Dominus Extreme motherboard that I worked on a while ago. But yeah, TRX40, eight memory slots, four memory channels. Uh, we've got four PCI Express physical by 16 slots that is available in up to X16, X8, X16, X4, well, more or less X4 in the bottom slot. The PCIe layout is a little weird on this motherboard. It's designed for like dual triple slot graphics cards and still give you a little bit more room to breathe. But if it were me, I would have probably done the layout a little bit differently. Um, there is also some shared bandwidth here. So there's a, there's a ton of USB connectivity on this motherboard. It has dual type C front panel connections in addition to, you know, the 30 pin uh, USB connections for the front and a ton of SATA. Let's talk about the physical layout of this motherboard. At the top of the motherboard, we have the massive VRM heatsink. Now, this motherboard doesn't have phase doublers. It's something Asus refers to as a teaming VRM solution. Uh, I'm not gonna really comment on the VRM situation. Look, these new TRX CPUs, they will consume 280 watts out of the box. It's TDP 280 watts. But the reality is by the time you factor in overhead and all this other kind of stuff, you're looking at like 300 watts plus. Hardware Info 64 was regularly reporting, you know, 286 watts, 289 watts. While we were doing our benchmarks, even for extended periods of time and things like blender rendering. So the VRMs can get a little toasty. Fortunately, this motherboard has two VRM fans at the top and a heat pipe connection to the, to the rear IO. So this motherboard does a lot in the way of heat dissipation. There's also a chipset fan. So this motherboard has a total of three fans on the motherboard and you know, X570, some people complained about the way that those fans were making a little bit of a whining noise. Uh, I'm happy to report the fans on this do not kick on unless they're needed, but the chipset is setting at a rather toasty, like 62 degrees by default. Now the VRM fans did not kick it on at all, except in the heaviest workload. I've got this thing set up in the, uh, the Lian Lee, you know, uh, PC-011 XL. Bauer really knows how to make a nice case. It's got tons of USB connectivity, two extra ports at the bottom. It's designed for like the SSI EEB motherboards, like the 3647. In fact, I had the 3647 motherboard and CPU in this, the W3175X, a $3,000 Intel CPU that cannot touch the ROG Zenith 2 Extreme. Good Lord. That's crazy. Think about that. A $3,000 28 core CPU from that we saw at Computex in 2018, can't touch a $2,000 CPU from AMD that they've glued together. This motherboard also has inputs for water block stuff. So in addition to having some analog temperature sensors in the box that you can plug into the motherboard and just you know tape those analog temperature sensors to whatever you want, there's also Asus's new cool, uh, if you're gonna do the custom loop water block cooling thing, you can plug that directly into the motherboard and it'll give you flow sensors, it'll give you the reservoir temperature, it'll give you the, the block temperature if you want it to. Asus has really done a lot of cool stuff to integrate fan sensors and fan sensor expansion and things like that in general on their boards, but there's still no GUI to set the fan curves. Like you just enter in percentages through a menu. It's effective, it works. I shouldn't be annoyed by that, but every other motherboard vendor has got a nice GUI for managing fans. Asus, usually ahead of the curve. Come on, get it together. One thing you're gonna notice on all these TRX40 motherboards is generally they're gonna be four slots. The reason for that is PCI Express 4.0 is expensive. 
to build an interface for. Me personally, I would love to see a TRX-40 motherboard that is like X16, skip a slot or two, X8, X4, 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 or X16, skip a slot or two, X16, X4, X4, X4. That would be great. People need stuff like capture cards and add-in peripherals, things like that. Five slots would be better than four. I certainly wouldn't complain if there were six, but pretty much every motherboard for TRX-40 right now, four slots, just some combination of things. This motherboard, because it's got a ton of add-in peripherals, uh, M.2 number three shares bandwidth with an AS Media controller. So if you want the AS Media USB ports, you will have to uh, give it two of your four lanes in that M.2 number three. Now, fortunately, you've got M.2 on the back of the motherboard and M.2 2 M.2 on the front of the motherboard and DIM.2. So this motherboard will power, will interface with, right out of the box, five PCI Express 4 NVMe drives. That's crazy. And of course, Store MI is still a thing. You can do the NVMe RAID, you can do SATA RAID. Uh, it's uh, one, five, or one, zero, and 10, no RAID 5 on this particular setup. Store MI is gonna handle that for you. We've done videos on that in the past. Not really much has changed with that. Still a little a couple steps to set up your Windows 10 installation, but uh, that's enough jibber jabbering. Let's actually go to the workbench and take a look. Here we are in the old test bench. So, what's the verdict? Well, I like the Derbauer case, it's nice. It's got hot swap bays, two, two dual three and a half inch bays. It's nice, high quality metal. Got the NZXT Kraken X62 in here for cooling, which held up surprisingly well. I mean, it's got the Asetek bracket. The Threadripper still come with the Asetek bracket, so a lot of my testing I did with the Kraken X62 in this case, in this configuration, it works surprisingly well. Linux support, TRX40, basically okay. I did my testing with Fedora 31, which is affected by the machine check exception, kernel panic, but it's a one-line fix in the kernel. It's not a big deal. Other than that, Linux on this thing screams. It is an unbelievable, unbelievable workstation. I can't believe how obsolete the 2990WX is. I mean, it's not, I say that somewhat facetiously, but uh, <laughs> this, this, this thing is, it's an utter monster. Some other changes I would recommend, Asus Armory Crate. So there's a feature of Windows, if you're gonna run Windows, that will helpfully automatically install software. I don't like that, that seems terrible. Windows telemetry is bad enough as it is. The Armory Crate option in the UEFI will allow Windows to automatically run an ASUS binary when it first boots up, which will install the ASUS Armory, Armory Crate. I guess that's helpful if you don't care, but I disabled that. Also enable IOMMU, because the IOMMU separation is pretty good, all the PCI Express 4 devices. We've got separation of the chipset PCI Express 4 devices, as well as the stuff that's wired directly into the CPU. The separation on this motherboard is actually pretty good. There were a few USB controllers that were grouped together, but overall, the IOMMU separation on this motherboard is quite good. For all my Linux and workstation testing, I'm still using the Liquid HHHL. This is a 1.2 million IOPS per second, half height, half length, PCIe SSD card. This will show up as a RAID device, or actually I'm running Linux MD with the four NVMe devices on here. It's PCI Express by eight interface. Yeah, eight gigabytes per second, no problem. This is, the ultimate Linux boot drive. So there you have it. Fairly solid Linux support. If you work around the multi-core enhancement thing, there's a guide in the forum for doing that. It's a solid board. It works really well. Had pretty good luck overclocking it. Pushed over 500 watts through the board. It's got the auxiliary PCI Express six pin connector as well as a four pin Molex at the bottom for even more power stability if you're gonna have a lot of add-in graphics cards, things like, you know, well, not just graphics cards, anything that's gonna draw a lot of power from the motherboard. So it's nice to see those kinds of features on this motherboard. And let's run through the rear IO real quick. We've got the clear CMOS button, the BIOS flashback button. We've got the Intel 2x2 Wi-Fi 6 AX200. Now I'll give you a hint. If you're installing Windows on this motherboard and you're having weird problems, disable the Intel Wi-Fi 6 2x2, one of the shipped Windows 10 installers, because they don't have any testers anymore. Come on, Microsoft. The drivers from Intel or Microsoft or somebody would cause a blue screen. It's basically impossible to install certain versions of Windows 10. I think this is pretty much resolved at this point, but if you happen to have an old Windows 10 USB stick and it's like giving you a blue screen, disable that Wi-Fi 6, set up Windows 10, let it update, then you can re-enable the Wi-Fi 6 and everything's fine. It's just there's a buggy driver that was bundled with the Windows 10 installer. 
We've got the Aquantia 10 gig LAN. This is the AQC 107. That's a nice 10 gig LAN controller. Of course, it does support 2.5 gig and 5 gig. 10 gig ethernet switches are still a little on the pricey side. Asus has got some options there as well, but 10 gig LAN right on board. That's a must have feature on something like TRX40. If you're spending $2,000 on a CPU, you dang well better have 10 gig on the board. Also got four USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports. That's five gigabit. You've got seven USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports. That's 10 gigabit, that's crazy. And we've got one USB 3.2 Gen 2x2 port. That's 20 gig, 20 gig USB, that's crazy. We've got one optical SPDIF port and five LED illuminated audio jacks. So yeah, I first saw that on the uh, ROG Dominus. They put LEDs inside the jacks. In terms of memory support, the memory test regimen on this motherboard from asus is up to ddr4 4600 plus that is an oc if you're going to run 256 gigs of memory on this motherboard the official supported uh, speeds from amd uh, do sort of step down as your memory density increases just like second gen threadripper just like first gen threadripper so 3600 was a sweet spot for me i had no problem running uh, 64 gigabytes at 3600 so that's pretty cool the official Max supported speed though, 3200. So it is a bit of an overclock with that whole DDR4 3600 thing if you're using a 64 gigabyte kit. Now our audio solution here is the ROG Supreme FX 1220. Yeah, I mean, technically that's based on a Realtre Realtek ALC 1220 audio codec, but ASUS has added the ESS Saber. Uh, that is the 9018 Q2C high definition DAC and they bundle Sonic Studio 3 and Sonic Radar and DTS Unbound. So it is a really pretty high-end audio solution that is built into this motherboard in terms of um, signal to noise ratio measured, 120 dB signal to noise ratio, and uh, a little less than 108 dB signal to noise ratio for recording. So uh, that's not bad though. That's actually pretty good. You're gonna pick up more noise than that on a crappy analog microphone cable, on an unbalanced cable. So, meh. This is the first TRX40 motherboard that I reviewed. The TRX40 motherboards out the gate are surprisingly high end, but that makes sense because we've got, you know, a $1,400 to $2,000 CPU. There's really only two CPU options at this point in time. Spring is probably gonna bring us the 64 core, but operating system support is probably gonna be a little exotic because 64 threads, 32 cores, 64 threads is right at the limit of what Windows 10 Pro can handle without being dumb. So the 64 core, it's gonna need a little bit more time to bake, a little bit more love for Microsoft. Now, of course, if you're on Linux, psh, you're gonna be fine. It's gonna be a dream, 64 cores, dual 64 cores on Linux is already a dream. So it's only gonna get better from here. Well, it's been a quick look at the ROG Zenith 2 Extreme. I'm Wendell, this is level one. If there's anything that I missed, it's gonna be in that forum thread on the level one forums, so. First motherboard out the gate. The OLED screen is nice, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I would change. Maybe a PLX chip to better share the, the lanes, but PCI Express 4 PLX, that might drive up the cost. I don't know. But then again, this is already kind of a pricey motherboard. So TRX 40, 32 cores, fastest CPU on the planet. Well, for desktop use, pretty much. Fastest do everything CPU for the desktop on the planet. How about that? All right.